Y'all, today I got a really special treat for you. Uh, I'm Brian with Muscle Car Solutions, and let me introduce to you an incredible guest for the channel. Um, you think of folks like John Cozzi, Warren Johnson, Keith Dorton, Ron Shaver, Billy Godbold, Ben Strader. I could name a dozen more, all respected leaders and experts in their field. And today's guest for sure fits into that same category as those gentlemen. He's a tribologist, entrepreneur, teacher, uh, vice president of sales and marketing for Total Seal, Mr. Lake Speed Jr. Lake ah, thank you, Ryan. Man, that well, you shouldn't put me in the in the group of those guys. Those guys are are my heroes uh, for certain. A lot of them are friends. In fact, every one you named is a friend of mine, and uh, I'm thankful for all of them and what they've been able to share with me and help me along the way. And as you kind of said, we we want to give back. You know, we we've, we've been very fortunate in this industry, especially with my dad being a NASCAR driver. I've grown up within this industry my whole life. Uh, even before dad was NASCAR racing, we were go-karting and traveling all across the country in a van to go race. So I've been racing literally my whole life. Industry has been great to me. So I love opportunities like this where we can give back and share some of the knowledge and some of the experience that's been gained by people like John Cozzi and Warren Johnson and John Callies, Mark Cronquist, Ben and Billy, uh, my really good friends, and what they've shared with me. Hopefully, we can share some of that today. Yeah, I, uh, it's one of the things I really admire about um, the the Engine Performance Expo that you put on and and have done for is that two, is that the second year? Um, yeah, we've done it for two year? years now. We've actually done four separate events in two years. Um, I don't know. We're crazy, but it, it's, it's <laughs> been tons of fun. We've learned a lot along the way. It's, you know, it's been really neat, Brian, to see how many people are actually, you know, pulling back the curtain, opening up the black book and sharing what they really do. Where, you know, think about it, you know, 10 years ago, what we've done these last two years with the Engine Performance Expo would have been an unheard of. If, if I had been going around telling all the other uh, NASCAR teams about what we were doing at Joe Gibbs Racing 10 years ago, they'd have fired me. i had been blackballed from the industry. So it's crazy to think that this gigantic, you know, paradigm shit that happened in the industry where now all of a sudden we're like, no, 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 please, everyone be willing to share your information, share your experience with others in the industry, because it's so important to the survival of the industry that people get the real information, the real facts of what's current today. So that, you know, the old saying goes, you know, as the tide rises, it lifts all the boats. That's what we're after here. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of laugh at that a little bit. I mean, I, I, I think it's just maybe we're all getting a little bit older and we realize, hey, uh, you know, our time here may be a little shorter than we want it to be. And, uh, you know, before we go, it's time to, you know, teach everybody the things that we've learned to know. But uh, I had to kind of laugh a little bit about that because I don't think you're going to sit down and have a, a conversation with WJ and squeeze too many secrets out of them. Oh, no, no, no. Some people <laughs> are still uh, uh, pretty hard and fast in their ways of how they do things. You're not going to get a lot out of them. But, you know, there's on the other side, you got a John Cozzi who's like, I'll tell you everything. There's, I won't hold anything back because you know, one, he already recognizes that it doesn't hurt him for someone else to know what he does. That, yeah, and that sounds counterintuitive, but he's like, that's not going to hurt me because already people are. People already know that I know what I'm doing and the customers I take care of are going to stay with me. They're probably not going to go somewhere else. Um, but the reality is knowing something and then doing something are actually different things. You can know what to do, but are you willing to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go out there and do all the hard work and spend the money and buy the equipment and do all that? You can know what to do doing it something different. And I think that's one 
one of the reasons why these guys are now more willing to share their secrets is because they realize that it requires someone to do something different and to make a different effort or to spend money in order to get there. And that just because someone knows the path doesn't mean they're going to follow and walk that path. Yeah, that you're exactly true. You gotta, you gotta be able to, uh, you know, do all the heavy lifting. That's for sure. Uh, but I love that work that y'all are doing with that engine performance expo. And I'll, I'll leave a link to it in the description. That's definitely a channel uh, to go check out, watch the videos. They're, they're kind of broken down into some really short interviews. And, and if you want to learn from any of those folks that we mentioned earlier, or, or uh, Lake had mentioned, they're really, really good pieces just to grasp onto for some really good knowledge and and let them share their secrets with you. So kind of a cool deal. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, I'm happy to do it. You know, th- th- this year's was actually kind of the, to me, the, the, the most fun one because we had the put up or shut up moment, <laughs> you know, with my dad's engine. So uh, if anybody doesn't know, you know, my dad was an NASCAR driver from 1980 through 1998. We owned our own race team during that time built their own engines and then in the early 2000s after dad had kind of given up you know, the driving part and given up being a team manager and doing all that kind of stuff he did some vintage road racing you know vintage stock car stuff he did that for a little bit and then decided to get into the vintage karting well the because the karting stuff was his first passion in life and he's still awesome at it he's 75 years old by the way still goes out there and rides the go-karts every week and is still super fast so it, it's pretty cool. But he had his engines from the vintage stock car stuff literally sitting on the floor of the shop for almost 20 years. <laughs> and we drug one of them out this past summer and decided, you know what, let's go put this thing on the dyno, get the car fresh and back up, and we'll take Dad back to the track one more last time, which that's going to happen this spring. <laughs> so, so we found the dyno sheets of this old engine. The Ford C3 headed engine. This would have been a mid 90s era engine uh, for for the Cup deal. It made 690 horsepower in 2002. We put it in the dyno this summer, and it made 480. <laughs> and we were like, wah wah, what the heck? You know, of course we figured, okay, there's going to be something glaringly wrong in this engine. Had the motor over at Pro Motor, Dennis Borm and those guys there who actually built engines for dad at the very end of his career when he was driving for Melling Racing. Took the engine apart, had all those guys check everything, and we couldn't find anything wrong. Like, Mm -hmm. glaringly wrong. Like, you know, 200 horsepower wrong. That's what we're looking for. We're looking like 210 horsepower wrong. Can't find it. And we did find a couple of cylinders where there was some rust. So those cylinders weren't as nice as the other ones. The other ones looked perfect. I mean, no rust. Everything was great. There's two of them with a little bit of rust in it. Uh, a little bit of that rust debris you could find in the top ring groove. Uh, you know, not severe micro welding or anything, but a little bit. You know, the blow by was a little bit high. Uh, I'd say about 10 CFM. Uh, you know, so it was higher than you'd like to see, obviously, uh, on that engine. So we kept the same block. Same head, same cranks, rods, manifold, distributor, you know, oil pan, all this stuff. But we took the engine over to uh, KB Racing and had Greg Anderson hone the block using the new Rottler, you know, six diamond head profile, doing the right. new style home, which we'll get into, you know, at later because that's a whole discussion by itself. So, you know, proper home for modern rings. You know, the old pistons were from CP, and they uh, were good pistons. They had pretty much state-of-the-art design back in the day. It had an 043 top ring, a ductile molly style ring, uh, 1.5 millimeter second ring, 3 millimeter oil ring, which that was pretty good. I mean, at that time, you know, 2002, state-of-the-art deal over at Gibbs is an 043, 043, 3 millimeter. So it really wasn't far off from what state-of-the-art was at the time. So we had new new pistons made. We went to a 0.7 millimeter, 0.7 millimeter, two millimeter ring package, you know, with the mm. correct tone. 
uh, bump the compression up just a little bit on it. Uh, still going to be running the, you know, in the old days, they ran the Sunoco, you know, or 76 Supreme 114. Well, now we've got this, uh, you know, NASCAR E15, you know, so so about 104 octane. So we had we couldn't go crazy, you know, do like 15 to 1 or something like that. You know, we kind of kept it right around with the NASCAR uh, deal, which was 12 to 1, which is what, it, what the rule was back in the day. So we kept it right there. This engine before had been a little bit lower than that, uh, just probably for safety's sakes, I guess. So anyway, we did all that work, went to Billy, uh, our, my buddy over at God, uh, Godbolt over at Comp Cams, you know, Edelbrock Group, and said, hey, here's the cam that's in there. What can you tell me about it? And he looked at the cam grinds like, oh, man, this is like <laughs> one of my first really successful cam grinds in, in NASCAR. He said, I, I can do something a little bit more modern, a little better than that. So you know, modernize the valve train a little bit. Long story short, we take all of this information from all those guys you mentioned, you know, their experience and, you know, put it all together in this engine, you know, again, same block heads, manifolds, distributors, all this stuff. And we went from making 600 or say, you know, 480 this past summer, we made 780 when we dynamited it a few weeks ago. <laughs> so it picked it up 300. And now here's my favorite part of this whole thing. There's actually two favorite parts. One is that if I give Billy in the valve train a hundred, pretty good number, right? Yep. Yep. Give him all the gain of what it was previously. That means 200 horsepower was just in ring seal. Cause that was the only thing we could say that would have been wrong or off about that engine was two cylinders being slightly hurt. That's an incredible number to think if you think about it. 200 horsepower just from ring seal. I think I don't I don't think uh, anybody that's been exposed to any amount of performance engine building, racing, whatever, would ever argue with you that you couldn't find 100 horsepower out of a really good modern lobe cam profile, especially if it's done by by uh, Billy. But that's easy. How do you wrap your head around a couple hundred horsepower in that ring package, uh, the seal, the surface finish? I I don't. I'm not smart enough to understand that. And that to me is cool because you're I'm sitting here like a, a little kid going, how's that even possible? Is it yeah. magic? I mean, it's just awesome to think about that. Well, so here's, there's a couple of things. One, I'm going to give you some, a couple examples here of how other people have seen, I'm going to call them somewhat similar numbers. In, here recently i know of a really good uh engine builder good have been a long-term friend of mine that bought one of the new rottler hones uh mm -hmm. this past summer and I, their top engine that they work with their top guy made 850 and they said all right this thing's coming back in for a freshen up we're not going to do anything to the engine other than hone it with the new home. We're going to put new sleeves in it, do this stuff, everything, so it's back to the same bore size. So basically identical to what it was before, other than the home. Because they really wanted to see how much they were going to gain from the home. They put it in the dyno and made 800. <laughs> and they were pissed, right? I mean, they just, <laughs> just livid, you know. <laughs> Everything's the wrong. We, we uncovered it we tried different fuels different oils maybe different I mean, we tried everything and the thing just doesn't come back they they have the profilometer they're measuring the cylinders right hey man we're hitting the numbers all this long story short they had the wrong grit abrasives so it was mm -hmm. happening to try to hit the numbers they were having to run the machine at a much higher load, which was actually one, distorting the bore. Mm. Number two, they were getting fake numbers, right? And we won't get into into real numbers versus fake numbers and all that, because again, that's a that's a <laughs> mind melting um, 
discussion. But the reality is you can get fake numbers because what was happening with those those particular abrasives, the the we call them the valleys, you know, that are formed when you have the, the crosshatch. The thing about that crosshatch, what's it doing? It's mm-hmm. a, an abrasive that's making a scratch that is giving you that depth. Well, that profilometer can read that depth, but what happens if what I'm really getting isn't actually a deep valley, but I'm getting this big buildup on the surface because what I'm doing is I'm actually kind of smearing. I'm not cutting a trench. Mm-hmm. I'm actually smearing material around. So that's where that fake number can come from because mm-hmm. if it's all smeared around, guess what happens? It doesn't take very long and it's just, it's a mess, right? It's mm-hmm. not a good surface that's going to seal. That's what was happening. They ended up swapping abrasives, got the right grid abrasives that were rougher. They mm. could lay that deep valley like they needed to back the pressure off. Same engine made 870. Nothing That's else changed. Amazing. Same fuel, same oil, exact same engine made 870. I was like, wow, okay. That that's giving you in, in some ballpark here. And then just the other day, coming out of the expo, actually, one of the a diesel, you know, track pu- tractor pulling diesel guy mm-hmm. had watched the expo and saw what we were talking about on some of the surface finish stuff, dad's engine, everything, and some of the top fuel cylinders we were hunting there. And they tried applying that idea of, hey, we're gonna go with a rougher grid abrasive. And we're going to take it all the way to size. And then we're just going to do the count the number of strokes it takes until we get that those peaks knocked down and have that true extreme plateau. They called Ed Keebler at Rottler after they had, you know, they ordered the abrasives right after the expo. So we want to give that a try. Ordered them, got them in. They called Ed back after they honed the first block and put it together and put it on the dyno. Now, these big, these are big diesels, right? They make big power, mm-hmm. like you know, several thousand horsepower. They, they make around three thousand something horsepower. They picked up three hundred horsepower. Unbelievable! Yeah, <laughs> by adding that RVK, <sighs> and it's like wow. So the reality is, yes. This is one of these big <laughs> new levers that we can pull. Wow. And it's, and it's, but the thing is, it is kind of nuanced, right? Because it's not just about using a rough grit abrasive, you know, versus a smooth grit abrasive and all that. It, it's really about having, you know, creating this engineered texture. And when you get it right, it really works. But like the case of my buddy, when you got it wrong on the first go, man, it can really mm-hmm. hurt you. So it, it's something that you have to be very careful of. Um, you got to have the right tools, you know, to yeah. be able to measure what you're doing so that you know you're getting that engineered surface. You're not getting a big hot mess, you know. So it, it's but it's exciting, though. It's really exciting to see massive gains uh, come from something that people are just kind of taking for granted for a while. And. I want to go back to, I said, there's two kind of two things about that, those examples. And then how is that even remotely possible? Why is this all of a sudden something now that's happening and it hadn't really happened or been talked about in Mm -hmm. the past? Well, the key thing is this, the ring materials have changed. You know, for the last 50 years, a ductile molly ring, you know, it's a ductile iron ring with a molly face coating on it, has been the standard. That's what everyone's pretty much used. Even Dad's engine, you know, state-of-the-art NASCAR 20 years ago, it was a ductile molly ring. Mm -hmm. May have been thinner, but it was still ductile molly. So the key thing with the ductile molly is the molly is pretty soft, but most importantly, it's porous. It mm-hmm. actually can hold oil. 
So that porosity means that the valley or the, the cylinder finish could be pretty far off and it would still maintain some seal because the oil is actually the gasket between the piston ring and the cylinder wall. Without oil, there is no ring seal. Yeah. That's the same for a compressor. That's the same for an engine. doesn't matter. Oil's the gasket. But what's happening is with these modern fuels, oxygenated fuels, the turbochargers we have now, the superchargers we have now, the big injectors mm -hmm. and stuff, these crazy billet carburetors and stuff. I mean, we're making more power than we ever have before. Well, the only way to make more power is to put more fuel mm -hmm. into the engine. Liquid fuel, because that's what happens. There's liquid fuel going in your engine. I mean, we hope that all of it vaporizes <laughs> and then we can burn it. But a lot of times you don't vaporize all the fuel, but you got liquid fuel going into the cylinder. It's washing the oil off the cylinder wall. Yeah. And we can see that with oil analysis. I actually was doing some samples for a customer last night, looking at them, 8% fuel dilution in an engine. Wow. That's a ton. <laughs> I can tell you the really good NASCAR stuff that we do an, an analysis for is a half a percent. Wow. You know, in a 500 mile race is half a percent. This stuff's 8%. It's crazy. It's it's insane. I mean, top fuel stuff is somewhere in that 8 to 10%. It, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the most ridiculous thing on the planet. It's top fuel engine. So you don't want to be having your fuel dilution anywhere near what a top fuel engine sees. That's never a good thing. <laughs> so the point is, when you're putting all that fuel in the engine, man, you got to have some valley to hold the oil mm -hmm. to resist the fuel being washed away. And back to the Dr. Molly thing, those old rings would hold some oil. So it would, it would do something. But today's steel rings, because the steels are so much better material than ductile iron. It can handle the heat from boost. It can handle the nitrous. It can handle all that. That steel is not porous. It doesn't mm. hold oil. Mm. This is where the key linchpin is. You've got oil in the cylinder, so there's going to be some level of seal there. But to get the really good ring seal, it's not about the ring. It's all about the hone. You got to have that deep valley to make it go. But if you just make it rough, you're still going to have a higher level of blow by. You're never going to get that ring seal. You have to have that engineered texture where it's literally flat on top but these deep valleys underneath. That's the key, and that's where that big power comes from. That that's interesting. So from from the from the total seal standpoint, from the, as a ring manufacturer, when you get somebody that calls up that's looking to build a seven, eight, nine hundred thousand horsepower, whatever, mm -hmm. and you're looking to spec a set of rings for them, is that one of the questions that you ask? Is tell me what honing process you're going to use on the engine so we can match it up with what you're doing. What we do is we kind of do the opposite. We gotcha. recommend a surface finish. You gotcha. know, we've, the last couple of years, we've been going around doing these NHRA track side tech talks. So if you, know, you come out to an NHRA race, mm -hmm. uh, easy about three or four times a year, we'll have a, a seminar set up, you know, Friday and Saturday at Matt Hartford's pit. And we go through and we talk about all these things, but we also, even in the catalog, we have a record. It's been there for years, by the way, I think like 15 years there's wow. been recommended surface finish numbers uh, in the total seal catalog of, hey, if you do this, it's going to work on 90% of the applications. Then you get into the crazy stuff. Hey, call us. We'll help you out. And we can kind of get you, guide you along the way. But because the good news is the same surface finish that works great for a steel ring will also work really great for a ductile molly ring. And here's how we know that. Mm. Way back. In 1982, an engineer from Sunnan did some testing with a piston ring manufacturer at the time, and they were actually creating some of these same engineered surfaces back then, doing dyno tests with a major OEM 
in finding the exact same kind of results we're talking about today. But because there wasn't Twitter and social media <laughs> and YouTube right. and things like that back then, it, it you know that that little white paper they I mean literally it was white you know typewriter paper hand typed right uh, is what they did back then. <laughs> it never made the rounds, mm. but someone made a had a copy of it, and we got a hold of it not long ago. And we we're like, wow, everything we've been talking about for the last couple of years is right here in this document. That at this point is 40 years old. <laughs> Nothing's new under the sun. Now they just, you know, back then, profilometers weren't something that people had um, in <laughs> a lot of back then. It wasn't yeah. something that was accessible. And so they were using that profilometer way back then to measure what was going on to see what that surface texture looked like. So they were able to dial in a process using the profilometer way back then mm. but back then that was again technology that wasn't readily available to every machine shop so you couldn't make sure you had it right i mean just last thursday i was over at ron shaver's shop and we were using the profilometer using the new software where you can see the the actual trace you're not relying on the numbers alone you can see the trace see that shape of that surface man in an hour we had it nailed hmm. we went from what they were using which was the traditional rougher type hone because they knew they they couldn't make it smooth because it wouldn't last with methanol we turned them around and got them that uh engineered plateaued finish again it took us an hour of just kind of playing around and bang here's a race block done ready to go so yeah the, the software the tools that are available today are what's empowering this change and making this possible, whereas it wasn't really something you could do even 10 years ago. Yeah, that's amazing when you think about it, because what you just described there being done in an hour, that's half a season's worth of work of, you know, guessing and, you know, seeing what results were at the end of the race or whatever and coming back and, hey, hey maybe that was what worked. And, it's just amazing to me that that the technology. I mean, we were. I've said this before on the channel in some videos that that you and I and folks our age are extremely lucky because we saw it in the early '80s and and '90s where we saw a limited amount of technology applied to motorsports in general, and now we've gotten to see all of these advancements in technology and equipment and materials and applying all those together and it's just it's ridiculous when you think about it i mean in 1980 I, I had a or 85 i had a probably a 250 horsepower you know el camino and i thought it was the greatest thing in the world it was fun to drive and oh, yeah. today i mean 250 every minivan in the parking lot out there beats that so exactly it's just it's just amazing I, i'd like to ask a question about that though too when it, when it comes to that um when you go back to the older older type of stuff um big thick top and second ring big heavy you know wide uh oil ring now you're one millimeter one millimeter three millimeter which is fairly common for a good performance piston um same situation there do you um with with those narrower rings um is does the surface finish and the hone make even more difference with those today because of the narrower uh, ring packages that are in there i would say this in general every piston ring whether it's a 564th a one millimeter or a 0.5 millimeter mm -hmm. wants that extreme plateaued surface that's just straight up it, it, it needs those valleys to hold the oil because the oil is going to do two things it's going to be the seal and it's going to be the lubricant to protect mm -hmm. it. So, um, obviously, the the big, heavy, giant ring really needs a lot of lubrication because it's a big file. Mm -hmm. I, I know this is going to be controversial, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I just, but these are just the, I'm a tribologist. I'm just here to tell you, give you the science. Okay. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger, okay? Um, the, a big piston ring does not seal 
better than a thin piston ring. It doesn't live longer than a thinner piston ring. It's just, no. What happens with that big piston ring is it's a big file. It wears your cylinder bore out faster. And it generates more friction within the engine. You think about a 1972 Camaro. That small block is going to have a 564th, 564th, 316th ring package in it. And that short block would probably do about 50 to 70,000 miles, and it was worn out. And it had to be way oversized to clean it up. You know, back to Ridge Reamers, why that exists. Mm -hmm. Why? Because top of the TDC is the mm -hmm. slowest speed. The highest load, that's the highest level of friction, the highest level of wear is right there. That's why it was all worn out, and you had to come in there and knock all that stuff out. Okay, you had, that's why you had to go oversize so much. Sometimes bore it out. Okay. So, if you look at today's Camaros with the V8, it's a 1.2 millimeter ring or a 1 mm -hmm. millimeter ring. That's half the thickness. Mm -hmm. And those things will go hundreds of thousands of miles. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. What's the difference? A couple of things. One, we went from cast iron or ductile iron, which is still an iron, you know, uh, type thing, to um, steel, either stainless steel or carbon steel. So you think back to that 1972 Camaro with a small block. I mean, it's going to be a positive fourth. 54 316th ring. And that engine might live about 50 to 70,000 miles and is worn out. And you got to bore it over and do all that because that big heavy ring has worn out the cylinder bore, you know, thus the ridge reamer and all that because it's worn out the top of the cylinder because that's the highest pressure, lowest speed. That's where it does the most wear. Now you go to a 2022 Camaro and what's the difference? Man, I think he's got a 1.2 millimeter or one millimeter ring. It's half the thickness. Mm -hmm. Yet that engine is going to live hundreds of thousands of miles and just run and run and run. Why? Thinner ring, but better material. And that's the real key that the today's thinner rings, they're not made out of iron. And that was part of the reason. I mean, not that these guys didn't know they couldn't make thinner rings, but back then the metallurgy allowed didn't wouldn't allow it. You couldn't make those rings super thin and live, and they would break. And they didn't have the right PVD coating. So today's rings have aerospace coatings that are much harder. I mean, for example, we use some titanium nitride coatings. If you've got a gold drill bit at home, you know, or a gold insert in the machine shop you work in or something like that, that just works better and lasts longer than all the other ones, there's a reason for it. It's called titanium nitride. It's a coating applied in a vacuum chamber that's built up on a molecular basis, not sprayed on like Molly. I mean, literally, Molly is sprayed on like you're spraying on paint. You know, it's thick and it's porous and all that soft, breaks in easy and all this kind of thing you talked about. I mean, but it doesn't last very long. You switch that over to the titanium nitride, which is 2,400 Vickers hardness and super smooth, no porosity. I mean, that thing will last. You know, if you think about the old school NASCAR stuff, like we were talking about in 2002, those engines with that 043, 043, three millimeter ductile molly ring lasted one race. Mm. At the end of the race, they'd be down five eight horsepower. <sighs> Today, they run a 0.5 millimeter ring. That's 020. That's half yep. the thickness. Yep. Titanium nitride coated steel top ring and that engine will run 1500 race miles and be down nothing on power mm. Mm. i mean that's just the proof that's just the facts right that's the proof in the pudding the thinner rings made of the right material with the proper hone just way outlives and outperforms uh the old things and don't th worry about heat being trapped in the piston we've done testing we looked at all this stuff oil is also a mm -hmm. coolant for the piston we yep. can take a 16th ring 
and a 0.7 millimeter ring. So you're going from um, 0.62 to 0.27 in thickness. Mm -hmm. Run the engine at the same speed, at the same load, with the same coolant flow through the engine, that 16th ring is going to run about 10 degrees hotter mm. on the water and about 15 to 20 degrees hotter on the oil mm. than the 0.7. Wow. So yeah. it's not, and the key, the key is the oil temperature there, Brian, because if it were trapping heat in the piston and not letting the heat get to the water, what would have happened is the oil temperature would have increased on the thinner ring yeah. but that's not what happened the opposite happened why because it's friction if you rub your hands together like this you're going to generate some heat that's why we do it on a cold day mm -hmm. we don't rub our fingers together like this <laughs> you know just your yeah. index fingers together because that yeah. doesn't generate any heat because there's not that much friction there so that, that that's the best way to think about all of this piston rings are not a structural component of the piston Right. The wrist pin is. Don't want a flimsy light wrist pin. <laughs> Rings or seals. You wouldn't put, you know, an iron rear main seal on your engine and expect it not to leak. Right. Or, or an iron head gasket. You need something that's pliable, that can conform, and that's what piston rings need to do. The thinner, more malleable, more conformable, yet resilient steels are way better than the old cast iron rings of the day. Mm. I I, that well, that leaves me down about 30 different rabbit holes with you, but I know I don't have you for the next <laughs> five hours. But I do have I I, I do like um, the way that that you that you give people the idea of how to think through these things. And when you talk about the application will dictate the chemistry that's needed for it. And we're talking right. about this situation right here. Does that also now, do you look and get a little bit more specific then on the oil and the base and the, the additive package that goes in there to support those thinner rings and those those types of pistons? So you get the, uh, the wear characteristics, you transfer the heat the way you need to and give the lubrication that you need for the cylinder. Does how, Yeah, that's how the next gear. That? Uh, yep. that, that, exactly it. I mean, that's like hitting hitting overdrive, you know, is getting the good oil, right? So you got the hone, you got the rings, you got all this stuff done. Well, how are you going to take care of it, right? So going to a, we'll call it engineered solution, you know, think about, you know, when I worked at Joe Gibbs Racing and we were formulating oils, I mean, that was the big thing. We looked at what the base oil was, how much heat could that base oil pull out of the parts? Because not all oils are the same. And I'm not just talking mineral versus synthetic. I'm talking about, you know, this base oil versus that base oil, which we can't, we won't kill you with the details on that. But certain types of base oils have a greater specific heat capacity and can pull more heat from the parts. Now, obviously you're going from a, Conventional oil to a synthetic, that's generally the trend, is that the synthetics are going to do a better job and they're going to pull more heat out of that part. You know, I, I run a 0.9 millimeter gas ported top ring in my own personal car. And I run a full synthetic. I run the driven DI30, which is one of the oils we developed that when I was working there. And for that reason, because I know the base oils in there can pull all that heat out of the piston. They're going to do a great job. I don't have to worry about, you know, that thinner ring having any issue. Plus, it has the right level of ZDP, the right type of ZDP, mm -hmm. uh, and the right balance of detergents, dispersants, and all that, so that my ZDP can do the job I want it to do in order to protect that ring so that I don't ever have to worry about putting a red dreamer in that engine ever. Because it because now I have the chemistry that can support that system. So uh, yeah, great question. Yeah, no, it, it it's made me think of about a half a dozen videos on on the the Total Seal uh, YouTube channel, um, your speed diagnostics that talk about all of those things, and and I will link 
uh, quite a few of those videos down in the description as well, because they are well worth, if you want to hear Lake expand on some of those things and get a little bit further into the weeds on that, there is a lot of good detail in there. And it's just, to me, it's, it's amazing when you're talking about that ring seal and the surface finish, and now what we know about modern oils and, and additive packages and all that, that's where that 200 horsepower came from. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It goes back to the fuel. Like you mentioned the oil analysis. That's a really key thing that we do. Uh, going way back to the early days of Joe Gibbs Racing, that was one of the things we were doing was taking oil samples from every race, from every dyno session, and then looking at what that says and then correlating those oil analysis results to what we were seeing on the parts. Because that began to give us this bigger picture, more of a 3D picture of what was going on. So, like even in my own personal car, I take those samples and I can see and know what's going on inside the engine without ever having to take it apart. You know, the I mentioned earlier about you know dads. Uh, there was a couple of really great things that came out of doing all that project. Uh, you know, one of them was really exciting and one of them was great, but it hurt. Uh, and the one that was great that hurt was the oil analysis results from that engine. So we were so excited. We picked up 300 horsepower. Everything's awesome and it's great. Of course, we did all that dyno break-in stuff and we took an oil sample from after the break-in runs. And then we put in the synthetic oils and we did all the other trick stuff and tuned it all up and put the better carburetor on. And we, we did all the things, right, to make make power and took the samples. Engine looked great. All the vitals are great. Get the oil, and oil, oil analysis results back. There's water in the oil. Those old porous <laughs> C3 heads have a leak in them somewhere. <laughs> it wasn't a ton of water, but it was enough water that we're not going to take that engine to the racetrack as is. Because, you know, Dad had mentioned that last time he raced it, it, it had started overheat. Well, it, the reason it probably overheated is it lost some water inside the engine, which is probably where that those rust spots came from. Now we understand why the engine overheated before. We can track it all the way back because of this oil analysis. So now we know we need to take the engine back apart. We need to go do some more pressure checking and do some more investigating to find the source of this leak, fix the leak, because we know once you fix the leak, the engine is going to run great, and we, have, we can go to the racetrack and not have to worry about overheating or having a problem like that. So that was the double-edged sword moment, because I was so excited that oil analysis yet again wins the day. It does exactly what you want it to do, is tell you when there's a problem before it, it's too late. but it ruined the day because now the engine we thought was wonderful and perfect, we got to go back into. But I'll say this. I would rather know that now and get the engine fixed while it's still in the engine shop than take that car to the racetrack with dad and have it overheat and ruin his last day at the racetrack. So yeah, it's you got to pick which side of the uh, the razor you want to die on. And But yeah, I love it and I hate it all at the same moment, you know? Uh, makes me kind of it makes me laugh a little bit because as a as a 20 year old uh you know private standing in a mo motor pool in korea and having a motor sergeant come up to you and handing you these little sample bottles and telling you to take an oil sample for the aoap the army oil analysis program and i'm thinking okay i'm a car guy i i, I kind of understand this but what the heck are you going to figure out if it's got enough oil in it or is it dirty is it an oil change <laughs> And, and I, I didn't really put that together until obviously just a few years ago when uh, when speed diagnostics was started and, and what the actual value of that type of program is and what you can actually learn about the health of your engine. Um, can you tell us a little bit about speed diagnostics and, and what service that provides? Yeah, sure. So back to Joe Gibbs Racing and what we were doing there for, for years, we had a development partner, which is one of the big major uh, additive manufacturing companies that makes the ad makes the additives that go into every brand of oil, every brand of fuel. Now, mm. There's all these different brands of oil and fuel all around the world. Uh, 
most of them are household names or a lot of them are household names, but the four companies that actually make the chemicals that get blended in to the base oil or the base fuel to produce the final product, uh, almost no one knows who they are. You know, Lubrizol, Afton, Oronite, and Finium are the four companies that make the, this chemistry. And we were partnered with one of them pretty closely for a long time. And then they had, they went through an ownership change and they kind of wanted to go a different direction. They weren't as interested in the, the racing stuff anymore. So we wanted to carry on doing the oil analysis because it was a really important part of the engine program. So we started it, right? So myself, uh, with some help from my dad, we created our own oil analysis company in order to be able to take care of the needs of Joe Gibbs Racing. And that's where it started, was taking care of the Joe Gibbs Racing teams and anything they needed. And then, of course, that spread to the teams they worked with, you know, like Kyle Busch Motorsports and things like that. And then from there, it just kind of trickled out into other uh, customers, people I knew that, hey, engine guy does this kind of stuff. Hey, I, I need that. And it's just kind of steadily grown via word of mouth. We've never, you know, ran a print ad or put an ad anywhere <laughs> for it, yet it continues to grow because people find that the knowledge that can be gained and what it's worth when you can save an engine and things like that are, are so incredibly valuable that, you know, spending 70 bucks to be able to know the health of your engine or the health of your oil in seven days, hmm, that's not a bad trade-off. I think, I, I think I'll do that. And yeah. so it, it's, and we get to learn a lot from it too. That's one great thing is doing oil analysis. We learned a whole lot more as well, because now we're seeing more samples than just the engines that we work on, we're seeing other people's samples and picking up more of their story. So as a collective, we start just getting smarter uh, by by the group osmosis, if you will. Yeah, I that's that's an interesting thought there, especially you know with the story of with Dad's engine and and getting the water in there uh, through that through the gasket or head or whatever. If let's say you have a a, a customer that 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 purchases the the service, uh, they send you back the sample, um, but it's a it's a classic muscle car or whatever it sits in the the garage quite a bit. Uh, maybe it's an HR oil uh, user, you know, whatever. There, it's very low, high storage time, low driving time, um, and you get that sample back and it's got a lot more water in it because it's sitting a lot more do you take those factors into consideration when you're providing that report back to them that you've obviously got a car that sits for a long period of time you may decide to change your your oil change interval or don't start it up in the winter time and and let it get up to temperature and then collect all that moisture and let it sit there for another month or two whatever the case may be how, how does that dictate how you r report back to the customer on that one well, absolutely, it dictates what we do, and so a lot of times we're able to go back to someone and give them a we'll call it an alternative uh, maintenance program than what they had been doing, right? Because it, it shows up that hey, the the method that you were told to do by whoever isn't working. You're going if you're going out there in the garage and cranking the thing up, you know, every couple of weeks. And letting it run mm -hmm. for a couple of minutes just to move the oil around and keep the springs from you know being set <laughs> in one spot and all these kind of different things that you you hear about that the end result of that is now my oil is full of fuel and full full of water mm -hmm. after three or four months well that's not good for your engine that that's so don't you know go away from that program don't do that anymore you know here's a different maintenance program they can come back and you can see the results that oh you're doing it the other way man, there's so much less wear in the engine because now I don't have all these acids. You know, one of the crazy things that people come some, can come, come up with is that, oh, well, I, you know, I can go 3,000 miles on the oil, but I only drive the car 500 miles a year, so that's six years. I've actually seen an oil completely degrade mm. in about seven months in storage. So the oil only has a few hundred miles on it. Yet the oil is completely degraded chemically. And the mm. customer was like shocked. You, <laughs> you go through and you explain to them what oxidation value is and how the oil is changing and you can map it out. Here's that that same oil is new. Here's what you have. And they're like, oh my gosh. And it's like, well, one, you're probably using the wrong oil for what you're yeah. doing. And number two, I mean, yeah, if, if you had gone 3,000 miles in this oil, 
you probably would have wrecked the engine. So it, it's it, there's a lot of near misses um, that we've been able to prevent by doing this. And you know, a lot of people say, you know, hey, if it saves me one engine, that's worth a lifetime of oil analysis. You know, at, at 70, yeah. if I say you do it once <laughs> a year as a health check, right? In 10 years, you spent 700 bucks, right? If it saves you one engine, it's going to save you <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars and a lot of headache, right? It's a really, really cheap insurance policy, as some people have kind of coined the phrase to do. That's that's amazing when you think about it. Um, and I guess it's the, it falls back onto the you know, we talked about, you know, the application dic dictates the chemistry. Well, now mm -hmm. you've got the answer on the chemistry side of it because you've gotten the analysis and you know exactly what condition your oil's in. So now you can go back and give the application what it needs because the speed diagnostic uh, uh, service and report will give you that information and give you a better direction to go. Exactly. It, it a little plug for the guys that driven, even though I don't work there anymore and have no ownership stake. I get nothing for it for this. <laughs> I just it's really great when we have a com a customer that's using driven oil that sends in the sample because I mean I formulated those oils. I mean, I know what that chemistry is like the back of my hand. So I'm even better with those than I am the other ones because I know the product so much better and know it in detail and can point out little things to the customer that I can see coming on even earlier and say, hey, you know, you might want to try using this other driven product versus that driven product because this one's going to probably be a little bit, do a little bit better for you given your specific application and situation you're in. So yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of fun having, you know, been an oil formulator, been the guy that runs the dyno and do, dud all of the mechanical testing and now to be able to be independent and sit back and have that knowledge base and be able to you know to help customers that's a lot of fun. that's what that is the joy of doing it for me is being able to have help the customers have those big win moments you know whatever that is either lowering the wear or preventing mm -hmm. a catastrophic failure you know my favorite reports are the ones when I've helped kind of coach a customer along and when they get the results back and everything's like a single digit or zero on the wear metals, mm. that's because that's like a plus that that's the goal is single digits or zeros. Cause that means there's like nothing there. You, you kill, you're killing it, right? You're, you're, right. that's lubrication excellence right there. And those are my favorite ones when they get one back like that. You don't have to apologize for uh, the the plug for Driven. I've done a dozen or so videos on that that product. Everybody on this channel knows I'm a very big proponent of that brand, but I'm also um, I also follow the chemistry first because that's what you know that's smart what... folks told me to do, and and it's it seemed to have helped every single time. Yeah. Um, question about about that. Um, so um, brand new break in. Um, obviously, you're going to get a, a lot. Do you recommend that we that you send a uh, do a sample after that initial break in, whether it's flat tap at hydraulic roller, solid roller, doesn't matter what. Um, will that help you determine what what the the longevity of that engine yeah, is, or what, the, what direction you go in with oil then? Yeah, yeah. So the break in sample is almost in one way the most valuable one you can ever take. Because that's going to be the high watermark. That's the highest amount of what normal wear that engine should ever see. So right. it's going to give you an idea of, you know, what parts wear in the engine, what you should kind of set your warning levels to. Because then, based on that, you want to see that trend analysis and see that level come down and maintain. Then if you see something spike up near one of those levels, you know you have a problem. Mm -hmm. There's no question in your mind if mm -hmm. all of a sudden one of those things spikes up near one of those levels where it was originally, you got something up and you need to address it. Well, we're I'm definitely I'm getting ready to break in uh, well, here in a couple of weeks as soon as the drive shaft comes in. Um, hydraulic roller, small block, 355, nothing. It's for my 71 GMC pickup truck. But 
going to use the service here on that first round and get a feel for it. And then, yeah, maybe a couple after that to, to kind of set and see where, uh, where things are at. So I'm really eager to, uh, to give that a try. And, and again, I'll leave the link down to speed diagnostics in the, uh, in the description. Cause it's, it's definitely worth, uh, that, that $70 investment is nothing. I've, I've, I've grenaded enough engines in my lifetime to know that, uh, I, I'd rather spend 70 than 7,000. So yeah, it's, um, that's smart it, math right there. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it, that's, that's math that I understand. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to shift gears for you and kind of put you sure. on the spot here. Okay. Um, did a flat tap it video here about a month ago. Um, mm -hmm. and talked about all the common failures that those guys are seeing, um, talked about all the important things. Oil is obviously a big part of that spring yep. pressures, break in procedures, big, heavy valve trains need a little bit different RPM on break in all those things. But one thing I did talk about and mention in that video was the use of diesel oil, not mm -hmm. as a break in oil, but as a long term solution for the chemistry to go into the engine match, match the application. And I had one viewer that kind of took a little offense to the way I described it um, and brought up some um, some articles that you had done here recently uh, about diesel oil and and how they work in those older engines. And can you talk about the chemistry and all that? And and what is the what is the the diesel oil today? Is there a one size fits all off the shelf? Are they all the same? essentially the same chemistry, they all have the same amount of ZDP in them, and talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. So I wrote an article for Hot Rod Magazine uh, back in the fall uh, about diesel oils, and yes, it, not just from, from uh, your viewers, from a lot of people who are, we'll call it, fans of diesel oil, who, who love their rotella tea, and they can take it from their cold, <laughs> dead hands. Uh, I, I get it, the people that, that that's their mentality. But I, I I broached some chemistry things that, and I tried to talk about it in, we'll call it layman's terms. I didn't get all the way into the weeds of the chemistry. And I think that's from um, some of the comments I've seen. That's where people who are, we'll call it, I'm going to call it semi-educated or, or higher level educated about um, chemistry, but haven't gone to the level of formulation detail and testing that I've been at could misunderstand what I was saying uh, because I was trying not to talk too high over everyone's head in terms of chemistry. And there's really three main things about diesel oil that make it not ideal for muscle cars. And that's the key thing is that if you have a muscle car with, you know, a flat tappet valve train, aftermarket parts where you're trying to make some horsepower, there's not a lot of oils at the part store that you can buy mm -hmm. off the shelf that are really going to give you the best protection. Mm -hmm. And let me say that too, as a disclaimer, everything I talk about, I'm trying to show you the best way to do it. You know, we, we can even go back to the piston ring thing. Can you build an engine with a 564? 564 316 ring package and hone it with a 320 grid abrasive? Yes, you can. It will run. It, it, it will absolutely work. No doubt about it. Is that the best performing engine? Is that the is that the best for longevity? Is that the best for efficiency? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know, you can put a diesel oil in a hot rod flat tap and engine, and it will run it will work you know i heard a guy the other day uh say this you know there's a special word reserved for the person that finishes last in medical school it's doctor doctor yeah. <laughs> if i'm having brain surgery that's not the guy i want i want the guy that's the valedictorian from medical school i want the guy that got the answers right almost Every time, not the guy that got the answers right statistically <laughs> more than half the time. There's a big difference. So that's that's my giant disclaimer here. What I'm telling you is what I've seen with my own eyes from formulating oils, testing engines, 
this is what's going to give you the very best result. Number one, the amount of ZDP in diesel oils is not always high anymore. Mm. It used to be that diesel oils had more than passenger car oils, but some of the diesel oils today now have lower levels because they're, they have to be both, well, this way, if the label says it's both API S N or SP yep. and CK4, it has to have the lower level of ZDP like the SP or SN rating uh, for passenger car is. Only the diesel oils without the passenger car ratings are allowed to have the higher level of ZDP. That's that's one thing. The other thing is that the types of ZDP tend to be pretty different in a heavy duty diesel engine versus a passenger car oil engine. And really what I'm talking about uh, is say the hot rod oils, right? Or mm -hmm. like the GP1 type oils are driven, for example. So the oils that are designed for muscle cars, formulated specifically for a muscle car, that type of ZDP is completely different mm -hmm. than what's in a diesel engine oil. A diesel engine oil is going to have what, what uh, the easiest way to say it is a time release, a slower reacting type of ZDP because you're designing those oils to go 10,000 or, or longer mile drain intervals at very high temperatures. So the type of ZDP is going to be different. You know, there's primary, secondary, RL, RL hardly doesn't really exist anymore. But even within primary and secondary, the different types of ZDP, there's also short chain and long chain. Okay, so the longer the chain length, the more like slow reacting it is. Mm. Because ZDP isn't just an anti-wear additive, it's also an antioxidant. It helps prevent the chemical breakdown of the oil that's triggered by temperature. So what would happen is that, let's say, if you use only a short chain secondary ZDP in a diesel engine oil, mm. it would be consumed yeah. all up and gone as an antioxidant way before it ever gave up as a wear additive. So, where, say, a modern diesel oil, let's say really, really modern diesel oil, may be a blend of primary and secondary, it's still nothing like the short chain secondary only that we're using in a high performance type oil. And I can tell you from the time, you know, working with the guys at Comp, you know, working with Billy, and we were doing uh, camware testing. We could take a diesel oil, different ones, like different brands, and for the same level of ZDP in a muscle car formulation, we would see a half to 60% wear reduction with the short chain secondary ZDP only formulation, same amount of ZDP total. So it could be, you know, 1300 parts mm -hmm. per million total than the uh, diesel oils. So the mm. diesel oils never, never produced the best results. In fact, there were some passenger car oils, off the shelf passenger car oils mm. that smoked the diesel oils <laughs> in terms of flight type of wear protection. I know that is heresy, but <laughs> you gotta remember they're using not only a different type of ZDP, they're also using a different detergent dispersant chemistry because the dispersant chemistry, because remember, diesels make soot and you got to take care of that soot because mm -hmm. soot can agglomerate and cause wear, bore polishing, things like that. Passenger car motor oils, gasoline diesel or gasoline oils typically don't create soot unless it's a DI engine. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to have all that dispersant. Well, the dispersant slows down and changes how the ZDP reacts because the ZDP has to react to create uh, the anti-wear film. So if I have, again, with a diesel, that kind of gets away with it because they tend to turn slower. Right. So there's actually mm -hmm. more physical time for that ZDP film to reform because the ZDP form is basically forming and getting wiped away, forming and wiped away constantly. The higher the RPM of the engine, mm -hmm. the faster that has to happen. 
So by changing the chemistry, the complete balance, detergent, dispersant, ZDP type, you can fine tune that replenishment for the RPM of the engine and make it work, which is what we saw doing all the cam work testing. So yeah, I, I stand 100% behind what mm -hmm. I said in the Hot Rod article because it's mm -hmm. based on literally hundreds, <laughs> if not thousands of hours <laughs> of testing flat tappet formulations to know exactly what works. You know, so the chemistry is a big part of it. And then, you know, I said the detergent part of it is a big piece of, of this. Uh, the higher level of detergent uh, that's in a straight diesel oil, not the mixed ones. Because again, if it says API SP on it, then it means it's an SP formula. that has to pass all the passenger car tests as well. So that's not really a, well, quote unquote, a true diesel oil because it's actually a mixed fleet oil that's different than a true diesel oil. A true diesel oil with no passenger, with no current passenger car specs is going to have a very high uh, calcium detergent package, which is absolutely the worst thing mm -hmm. you can ever put in a direct injection engine. So mm -hmm. it should never, ever go in there. Uh, that's already been proven over and over again. And, yeah. and then the anti-foam additives, you know, the, the, um, are different. You know, again, diesel oils, Diesels typically run much slower. They don't need to have uh, as quick an air release. So just looking at the silicon content alone isn't going to tell you everything about the anaphone package because they're actually non-silicon anaphone additives. And the, yeah. type, the type of dispersant and detergent package is also going to have an impact on the foam stability and what type of anafoams are in there. So you can't just look at the silicon content alone and determine, oh, this is how much uh, anafoam is in the package. Again, you gotta do a lot more detailed testing on that, which is, again, this is why this stuff is pretty complex. And while we would do, you know, wear testing when we were at Gibbs and at Driven and show the results of the wear testing, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. You, I mean, some people want to geek out in the chemistry now. Oh, that's great. Most people just want to buy something they can pour in their in, in their engine and know their engine is protected. And then the oil analysis right. gives you the ability to know whether or not that oil is actually doing its job. Yeah, I, I think that's the that's the beautiful part of putting all this together, knowing that there's different types of zinc or ZDDP. There's you know different additive packages that gets added to those oils. And just going back to what we talked about earlier, that that the application dictates the chemistry. And yep. and and another another little brilliant little saying, you know, that I I'll, I'll plagiarize you from from years ago that failure starts at a microscopic level. And understanding that and understanding did I make the right choice in using that that um, off the shelf shell or whatever diesel oil um, at the auto parts store because like you said it's easy we can go back now and with the speed diagnostic product we can determine hey was that really the best or am I starting to get different wear in different parts of the engine that I shouldn't be seeing because maybe I just made the wrong choice of the oil because I decided to follow what the internet was telling me instead of following the chemistry. Oh yeah, it's so funny, you know, in the, in the three years now that I've been at Total Seal, it's so many, it happens so many times, I can so, I'll say it out loud, man, proof yet again, application always dictates chemistry over and over and over again. And like you said, every failure, begins at a microscopic level mm -hmm. a grain dislocation you know a, a welding and then it propagates from there and if you wait until there's a hole in the oil pan you've waited too late in in order in order to you know protect your investment if you can catch it early you know the early warning doppler radar my daughter used to live in oklahoma so anyone that's in oklahoma knows what i'm about to say man they got the best weathermen out there in the whole world because they got <laughs> radar everywhere because these dead gum tornadoes are gonna show up <laughs> it's not a question of if it's a question of when and you want to know so you want to know way ahead of time but oil analysis is like your early warning doppler radar if you're in oklahoma for your engine you know that's simple yeah. 
I, that's I, I, again. I'm gonna I'm gonna plagiarize you again here. Um, just again, sitting in all those AERA or PRI seminars, but going back to your uh, description of the doctor um, and the <laughs> guy that graduates the last in his class is still called doctor. The API oil standard is like a D level student. It's just enough to meet the standard. Is that still fair? Is that still fair yeah. assessment? I will say that was true up until the current API SP product came out. And okay. I've actually been pleasantly surprised that the new API SP spec seems to have raised the bar. Hmm. Now, I can't say, because I have not tested every brand of API SP oil on the planet and can say, you know, across the board, all API SP oils are better than what was out there before. But the ones that I have tested in the last several years since API SPs came out, they've all done better than their previous counterparts. Mm. You know, brand to brand, viscosity to viscosity, they've all gotten better. Now, um, the one I'll say, well, no, they've all gotten better. Mm. Now, if you go to, we'll call it a true muscle car type formulation, it gets better yet. And a great example of that is Castrol GTX. Mm. So one of the worst performing oils we ever saw <laughs> in our valve train wear test uh, was Castrol GTX. So like the old API SM, which is a very high detergent level, uh, low zinc. So you had like, we'll call it 3,000-ish parts per million detergent with about 800 parts per million zinc. Um, that one was awful. One of the worst oils we've, we've ever saw in terms of wear protection. When they went to API SP, and they could for the pre, low speed pre ignition, they dropped that calcium level down from 3000 and brought it down to around like 1300, but kept the same amount as EDP. The wear got tremendously better because mm. you mm. had less detergent now competing against the ZDP. But Castrol now has GTX Classic, mm -hmm. yep, the higher ZDP version. It's better than the low ZDP version. So, you know, <laughs> ZDP still matters, right? It's, but it's, it's a great example of how, you know what? The answer is complex. You just can't yeah. say more ZDP alone is better. Because if you brought that detergent level down in that Castrol Classic, it'd probably be even better. Because it still has too much det uh, detergent in the Castrol Cl GTS Classic, in my opinion. Mm. You know, compared to, oh, I can tell you that, I mean, compared to, say, um, the GP1 oil, it doesn't work anywhere near as good. Right. You know, so it's, those are the kind of the fun things we get to play with, you know. Well, I, again, I, I, I could literally keep here for three more hours asking you questions, but I think we've learned quite a bit. And I think what we've done is overturned enough stones here. And like I said, I will link a lot of, uh, uh, Lake's videos from other channels uh, out there because I think there's there's a lot to learn here. But I, I think um, just following you know the basics of it and you know ask the questions and and I've always been a big proponent. If you don't know, then call that oil manufacturer, call up Driven, exactly. call up call up Total Seal and and ask him about you know surface finish and ring material material and and what type of seal you're going to get and it's just there's so many amazing things about this. We covered really three big topics today and how they all just fit together. I mean, it's, yep. it's the, it's the classic thing about building an engine. It's not the one part that makes all the horsepower. It's the combination of parts. And here yep. what we talked about today is a combination of all of those things, the, the ring seal, the surface finish that we didn't really talk about tension and the, and all that, but we'll, we guess, guess we'll link some of those videos too, but oils and, and making the right choice. And then, now you, you have a, a process and a, a service that can tell you, was that the right choice? Are those yep. right things occurring in the engine? So I, 
I just, it's, it's amazing to me. And, and again, I'm extremely thankful that uh, I got a couple minutes with you at PRI and, and talked you into spending a few minutes on the channel here today. It, it's I'm been, happy to do it. Happy yeah. to do it. We, 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 I'm happy to come back. If this opens another can of worms, we got more questions and things we need to deal with. I'm happy to do it because, you know, we, we want to share, we want to help people to understand it so they can put it into practice for themselves because yeah. You know, the things we learned at Joe Gibbs Racing way back in the day still apply. They're still true. Uh -huh. You know, the, the ring seal soup that I like to call it that we <laughs> were mixing up back then, they were pretty good. And it still works and it can help your engine uh, perform well. So we're, we're willing to have, we're more than willing to share that secret recipe. Like, I, I can't thank you enough, man. I appreciate the time today and uh, sharing a little bit of your knowledge and uh, some good stories about your dad and, and uh, you know, the, the cool things you've been able to learn over the years. Definitely thank you for the time. Happy to do it. We'll see you again next time.